The Bible says, What is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? You know, sad to say, there are a lot of Christian college graduates today that are living for all the things of the world and they're not living for what really is going to count for eternity. I wonder if we were to survey the crowd today, we were to say, what is motivating you? What is challenging you as you are going through college? Would it be, well, I want to get a good job. I want to make a lot of money. I want to be famous. I want to be popular. I want everybody to like me. Or would it be something like this? I want Jesus Christ to be honored and glorified no matter what happens in my life. You see, you can have everything the world has to offer and still be a miserable failure in the eyes of God. And I hope that your life is committed to Jesus Christ. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26. We're having a great time getting to know many of you. Sure enjoyed talking to some of you yesterday. We had a great time last night visiting with the basketball team. We rode along with them to their away game last night. And uh, they played a good game. They did not win, but they had a great game. We had a great time of fellowship, too. As, as a matter of fact, we, I, I can tell you that your school is treating your basketball players very well because we went to Burger King after the game last night. It was a tremendous blessing. As a, a matter of fact, I found out something very special about at least one of your basketball players. And one of your basketball players, he knows who I'm talking about, and he is an incredible Tetris player. As a matter of fact, his girlfriend is an incredible Tetris player, and uh, he, he has made that a special part of their dating relationship. As we were in the van last night, he was talking to his girlfriend, and we were giving him a hard time because uh, he was actually talking to his girlfriend about his Tetris game and her Tetris game. Unbelievable. You'll have to figure out or ask the basketball guys which, which guy that was. I won't tell you his name, but it begins with a letter S, okay? Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26. We had a great time with them last night. And uh, trust that we'll continue to be able to be around you folks this week and enjoy the time that God has given us to minister to you. I'm thankful for Christian colleges. I'm thankful for Clearwater Christian College and for the opportunity, Dr. Stratton, you've given us to be here and what a privilege it is and for the hospitality you've already shown us. Thank you so much. We trust that God will speak to your heart again today. We talked on Monday about having a biblical philosophy, making sure that we're, we're heading out into this world with the right kind of philosophy like the Apostle Paul. Yesterday, we learned that if we're going to impact people, we've got to be a soldier. We've got to be a good soldier. We've got to be willing to salute our commander and fight for a good cause and, and to wear the uniform of Jesus Christ and be strong and steadfast and serving and separate. Today, we're going to be talking about something that I believe will hinder, probably the greatest thing that will hinder the impact of any Christian in the culture in which we're living today. We're going to be discussing a, a matter called hypocrisy. Proverbs 26, verse 23, it says this, Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver dross. You know, this is an interesting verse. You may wonder what this verse is talking about. Well, that's why I'm preaching today. That's why we have a little bit of a message. This verse is clearly talking about someone who is making false professions in their life. One commentator said this about this verse, One who makes fervent professions of love and affection while all along their heart is bent on evil is like a cheapened earthen vessel covered up with a veneer of drossy silver. Several years ago at my home church, we invited a young man to come help us develop the property that God has given to our local church. Some of you might be familiar with Tri-City Ministries in Kansas City, where my dad is the pastor. About 20 years ago, uh, my dad became the pastor, and one of the things we did is we relocated the ministry onto a, about 100 acres of farmland that was right off of Interstate I-70. About a year after we purchased the property, the city of Independence, Missouri, said they were going to put a four-lane parkway right through our property with an interstate exit off of Interstate I-70. You can imagine the property uh, value escalated immediately. And so we invited this young man who was a graduate of Princeton University with a doctor's degree in economics to come to our ministry as a consultant to the deacons and the pastors to help us be wise stewards of the property. Well, there was one serious problem with this young man. One day, our business manager was looking over his driver's license, and he noticed that this young man had taken a pen and changed his social security number on his driver's license. Not a smart thing to do. As we began to research this guy's background, he had two social security numbers. Here's a guy sitting in our church, in our ministry, supposedly helping us, and guess what? He was a fake. He was a phony. He was a con artist. And he got caught. And the Bible still says, be sure your sin will find you out. You say, what is that? story have to do with this verse? Well, that story perfectly represents what this verse is talking about. 
And I believe all around in our Christian culture today, and probably even in this room, there are people who have become experts at putting on the right things and saying the right words and making sure they're conforming to all the rules, but down deep in their heart, they know they're not right with God. And my friend, that's hypocrisy. And one of the things that will literally ruin our impact in this culture is Christians who talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They're hypocrites. And Jesus had a lot to say about this, and the Bible has a lot to say about this. You say, well, Brother Mark, how do I know if I'm living in hypocrisy? Well, this morning, we're going to cover three characteristics of a person who has burning lips and a wicked wicked heart. Someone who is like that worthless clay pot that they're trying to cover up with a veneer. And it is so easy to do this in Christian college. It is so easy to just conform and to make sure nobody, we're not rocking the boat too much and everybody's okay with my life. But the real issue is not just what we look like on the outside. The real issue is, what are we like? Are we real, genuine, sincere, through and through? Turn your Bibles over to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. There is no way we can cover all the verses that have to do with what I would call hypocrisy or false professions or formalism, but there are a lot of verses in the Bible that deal with this matter. One of the worst things that could ever happen is that we would become pharisaical, that we would become hypocritical, and we would become just religious people. Listen, folks, it's not about religion. It's about a right relationship with God. And you need to keep your heart right. You need to make sure that you are real through and through, and you will destroy your testimony and destroy the work of God out in this community and around the world as you go out from this uh, this college. You will destroy your reputation and the reputation of Christ if you are a hypocrite. So the first characteristic is given to us here in Ezekiel 33. We'll start reading in verse 31. I think you'll see the burning lips and the wicked heart. He says here in verse 31, And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. Do you see the mouth and the heart? It says they have burning lips and they have a wicked heart. Verse 32 says, And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. Here's the characteristic again. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. Here is the first characteristic of a person who is fervent but fake. They have burning lips and a wicked heart. They're living in hypocrisy. It's when we hear God's word, but we don't heed God's warning. When we hear God's word, but we do not heed God's warning, we are like that worthless clay pot covered up with silver dross. Let me ask you a question. Who are you trying to fool? You can fool everybody here. You can fool the administration. You can fool everybody sitting around you and everybody here at Clearwater. But God knows what you're like because God sees your heart. And it is so easy to sit through chapel after chapel, Bible class after Bible class, service after service, and we get, be, get to become experts at hearing God. But the question is, what are we doing with it? Is it changing our life? You know, he gives a powerful illustration right here in the text. He says it's kind of like going to a concert. How many of you have ever been to a concert? Obviously, you've probably been to one here. How many of you have ever been to a concert before? All right. Uh, Hopefully, you go to the right kinds of concerts. There's a lot of good things we can enjoy out there. Let's just say for illustration's sake that we're going to load up in a bus today. and We're going to go down to Tampa and we're going to see the three tenors. How many of you have ever heard of the three tenors? Okay. Placido Domingo, Pavarotti, and Jose Carreras. I'm not sure if they're still traveling the world, but uh, I would love to hear those guys sing. You say, well, Brother Mark, I don't like opera music. Well, you may not like opera music, but you have to admit, those guys can sing. They would fill this room with their voices and probably fill this room with their bodies, too. Man, they're pretty big dudes. If you've ever seen them, I mean, they're huge. They can sing. Now we got the three Irish tenors, got the three American tenors, but the three greatest singers are those three guys I just mentioned. Let's just say we go down to the concert, we sit down right by the orchestra, and we pay big bucks to, to get our tickets. Some of us would be thrilled to be there. What do you do when you appreciate somebody's music? What do you do when you appreciate a professional like Pavarotti? If he did a good job, what do you do? Well, you, you applaud. You put your hands together and you applaud him. But here's what happens. You go home that night and you forget everything that you heard. As a matter of fact... He probably sang in Italian and Spanish and all kinds of different languages. You may not even understood what he was saying, but it was just beautiful music. And I believe that kind of music does glorify God as long as it's in the order and symmetry of creation. Sure, it does. And it's okay to enjoy that kind of thing. And so you applaud the singer. But in essence, when you go to the concert and you hear him sing and you hear somebody play beautifully on an instrument, 
All it is is beautiful music ringing in your ear and you forget about it later. It never changes your life. That's the illustration he gives here. You know what he's saying, folks, is when we come to chapel, when we come to church and we hear God's Word preached or we read our Bibles personally and we listen to the message, but it goes in and out, it's like doing this. Great job, preacher. Hey, that was a great message. Hey, we don't want you to applaud the message. We want you to apply the message. The Word of God is not to go in our ear and out the other. We are to take God's Word and to put it to practice in our lives. You know, there's another powerful illustration given to us in James chapter 1. You might be familiar with this verse. James 1 verse 21 says, Wherefore, laying apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, receive with meekness the engrafted Word, the Bible, which is able to save your souls. And be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only, listen to this phrase, deceiving your own selves. You know what I think? I think we have a lot of Christians who are deceiving themselves into thinking they're spiritual. My friend, we're not spiritual because we hear God. We are spiritual because we do what God says. And that's what makes a difference in our life. And James says, if you are a hearer of the Word and not a doer, it's like you're looking at yourself in a, in a mirror and beholding yourself and going away and forgetting what manner of man you were. How many of you looked in the mirror this morning? All right, I'm glad you did. You look really good today. It would be terrible to think that nobody looked in the mirror today. Let's just say for illustration's sake that you go to the mirror, and of course the girls pull out their tackle boxes, you know, they get all these tools out. I'm just glad I'm a man. Amen. These girls take these tweezers and pull out their eyebrows, and then they take a pencil and write them back on. Figure that one out. I'm just glad I'm a man, but the men stand in front of the mirror too. And I remember when I was in college, I had to make sure everything was right, make sure all those whiskers are gone, make sure that hair is perfect. Now, wouldn't it be interesting if we all came to chapel tomorrow morning the same way we woke up? I don't know about you, but I don't look good when I wake up. My hair is a mess. I got bedhead is what I call it. My hair is sticking up everywhere. Some of you have that problem too. You got sleep in your eyes. You got lines on your face from where you slept on the pillow. You go over to the mirror and you look in the mirror and you go, whoa, I got some problems here. And you start fixing things. Wouldn't it be tragic if you came to chapel yet tomorrow and uh, you came just the way you looked when you rolled out of bed. Some of you would be unrecognizable. We would wonder who all the new students are. Why? Because it's absolutely absurd to think that you would look in the mirror and see the problems and not do anything about it. That's absurd, folks. Obviously, when you see a problem, you do something about it and you change. Listen, is not the Bible like a mirror? I don't know about you folks, but when I come and I hear preaching and I read my Bible and my personal devotions, and when I'm challenged by the Word of God, God exposes to me serious issues in my life that need to change. How about you? So here's what happens. We look in the mirror and we go, yeah, that's a bad attitude. Yeah, that's a bad thought life. Oh, yeah, that's, a bad, uh, th that's bad in my life. Boy, I'm having trouble in that area. And we see the problems, but the fact is we walk away and we don't do anything about it. Real change needs to take place. You see, we're living in hypocrisy when we become just religious people who can hear the message, but we don't ever change. We don't ever do anything about it. You know what I believe? I believe Jesus was the greatest preacher ever to walk on this planet, don't you? What was the greatest message He ever preached? The Sermon on the Mount. At the end of the greatest sermon ever preached, here's what Jesus said. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him into a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Let me tell you something about the young people here at Clearwater Christian College. The most stable, secure, strong individual in this place is a person who is listening to what God says and doing what God says. God says you'll be planted on a rock. You'll have security and stability in your life. The ones that are being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine are people who are deceiving themselves into thinking they can just come to church, listen to the message, amen the message, say yes to the message, and never do anything about it. He says, but I will liken him unto a foolish man when you hear God's word, but you don't do it. I will liken him unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand and the rains come, the floods come, and they beat upon the house and the house on the sand does what? We used to do this in the song when we were kids, right? The house on the sand falls splat. You know what? The reality is there are a lot of people falling by the wayside today. And one of the reasons I believe is because they're deceiving themselves. They're living in hypocrisy. They're sitting in church. They're nodding to God. They're saying the amens, but they're not doing anything with what they hear. Listen, folks, preaching is to change our lives. What I'm doing here is not a speech. If it was, let me tell you, I'd be off the platform because I don't like giving speeches. What I'm doing here is not a lecture. Oh, I believe preaching is teaching. I, don't get me wrong, but preaching is primarily to cause us to be different. 
It's to cause us to make a decision to change something in our life. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to those who are saved, it is the power of God. And I hope that this week and every week, as you sit in chapel, you will listen to God and you will live what God says. And yet I went to Christian college and I went to Christian high school and I know how easy it is to sit in chapel and just kind of let it go in and out. I believe you ought to take notes. I believe you ought to mark up your Bible. I believe you ought to write things down that God is challenging you about in chapel. It is so important that while you're going through this Christian school that you don't become a hypocrite and just learn how to sit and soak and never change. Never do anything about it because a hypocrite will never make an impact in this world for Jesus Christ. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot that is covered up with silver draws. Are you that person that is just listening to God, but you're not living what God says? The first characteristic is someone who hears God's Word, but does not heed God's warning. What is it that you know God says, but you're not doing? Don't be a hypocrite. Be real. Be genuine. Turn your Bibles back to Isaiah chapter 29. I know this is a tough message. I have two purposes. Number one, if you're a hypocrite here this morning, you need to wake up. You can fool people here, but God knows what you're like. Don't be a hypocrite. And one of the greatest things you can ever do is just be honest with God about what's going on in your life. But maybe you're not a hypocrite this morning, but I, I'll tell you this because I know from experience and everybody in here could say the same thing. It is a temptation to just kind of go through the motions. And so it's not just to wake you up, but it's to warn you if you're not living in hypocrisy, not to ever let it happen to you. That we would, we would graduate a, a bunch of uh, young people from uh, Clearwater Christian College that would go out and make a difference because they're real and genuine and people see it in their lives. Number one, it's when we hear God's Word, but we don't heed God's warning. Isaiah 29, verse 13 gives us the second characteristic. It says this, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Number one, it's when we hear God's Word, but we don't heed. But I believe this verse teaches us this. Number two, it's when we profess with our lips, but we don't practice it with our life. When we profess with our lips, but we don't practice with our life. Let me tell you some folks, the professions that we make are not the most important thing. I'll prove it to you. If I were to walk up onto this stage and I were to say something like this this morning, Man, you should see me play basketball. I can play like Michael Jordan. What would all of you want to do? All right, let's clear the chairs away. There's the hoop. Here's the ball. Let's see you dunk like Mike. You know what you'd find out really quick? It doesn't matter what I say. It matters what I show on the court. Now, how many of you have ever played with some basketball player that talked to talk, but they didn't walk to walk? Have you ever played with somebody like that? It seems like the guys that talk the most trash are usually the guys that can't, can't even show anything with their game. That's why my dad always taught me, listen, you just go out and let your game talk. You don't need to talk trash. You don't need to say anything on the court. Just play hard and let your game talk. Because most of the time, the guys who talk the most don't play the best. And so you would find out really fast that it doesn't matter what I say on the platform. It matters what I show on the court. And you know what? I don't dunk like Mike, shoot like Mike, look like Mike. I only have a brother named Mike. That's all I have, okay? There's nothing, uh, nothing correlating between me and Michael Jordan. I don't play like Michael Jordan. It doesn't matter what I say. It matters what I show. And yet somehow in those kinds of illustrations, we all go, yeah, well, duh. But in our Christian life, we get this idea that we can just raise our hand and say we're committed to Christ. Oh, yeah, I love God. Oh, sure I do. Well, well are you showing it? You know, the Bible says in Titus 1.16, they profess that they know God but in works, they deny Him. Do you realize that we can actually deny our professions by the way we live? You know, this is even interesting that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I trust that probably the vast majority of young people here at Clearwater are already Christians, but the fact of the matter is, there might be somebody here who is a professing Christian, but you don't have real salvation yet. Why? Jesus said, not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, is going to enter, but he that doeth the will of his Father. He's not teaching works salvation. He's saying that you will be working out your salvation with fear and trembling, like the Bible says in Philippians. That if you are truly a Christian, the Bible says, faith without works is, what's the next word? Dead. All right? So you've got to have something to back up what you say. But it's not just in salvation, and I believe that's absolutely important. And if you're struggling with that, you ought to talk to somebody. If you're wondering whether you're a Christian still, and you say you're a Christian, but you don't see much evidence in your life, 
You don't see the perseverance taking place in your life where you are doing right and living right, not saying you're not struggling. We all struggle. But if you don't see any change of life, the Bible says you need to be saved. So you might be struggling with that. But you know what? Even as Christians, it's easy to say the right thing, but not really be willing to do it. My dad taught me this little phrase when I was growing up. Your walk talks and your talk talks. But your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Think you can say that with me? Say it with me. Your walk talks and your talk talks. But your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Do you realize you can tell everybody here at Clearwater that you love God? And out in the community, people are going to be scratching their head if you're not living for God. It doesn't matter what you say. It matters what you show. Several years ago, I was traveling on a ministry team, and I remember we stayed at literally hundreds of places. And, but this one particular place I want to tell you about, we stayed with some people that I would call pack rats. How many of you know what a pack rat is? Okay, Somebody that keeps everything. Hopefully, your roommate is not a pack rat. Okay, If so, your room is probably a mess almost every day. That's exactly what this house was like. I mean, they had stacks of stuff everywhere. It was unbelievable. I was wondering where my bed was going to be found. We dug through stuff and we found a place to sleep that night. But I remember we were uh, sitting at the dinner table with the, the gentleman of the house. And, and I remember he looked across the table and he said this. He said, I've got 30 riding lawnmowers in my garage. And I looked at him and I laughed and chuckled a little bit. And he said, you want to see them? I said, sure. Well, he proceeded to take Mike and I out into his garage. It was more like an airline hangar, like, you know, like a parking garage for lawnmowers. Unbelievable. He opened the door and there they were, 30 riding lawnmowers in his garage. You say, what, what was it for? Well, they had a youth activity at their church called the Polo on Wheels. What they would do is they would take all these lawn tractors. Obviously, they'd take the blades off the bottom. They'd take them over to a soccer field, some football field. They'd set up goals, invite all the teenagers from the community. Every teenager would get a tractor, a croquet ball, and a croquet mallet. Pretty cool youth activity, right? How many of you would have been there? They'd drive around the field trying to score their croquet ball, and they'd play polo on wheels. You say, that's a crazy story. What's the point? Well, the point is, he said something at the table, and then he walked us out there, and he showed it to us. You know what we need, folks? We need graduates from Clearwater Christian College who will come to this school and all the way through say, yes, I love God. I love God with all my heart. Oh, yes, I want to serve God. But then you need to leave out of these doors, and you need to go out into this world, and you need to show that what you say is really true. And start living for God and doing something for the cause of Christ. Just like that, young, that, that man took us out to his garage. You know, it's high time that we get some people who are willing to talk the talk, but they back it up with their life. You know, it's so easy to make decisions that we're not going to follow through with. Camp decisions. You know what those are. You make a decision, you say you're going to do something, and you know full well, even while you're making the decision, that it's not ever going to happen. Let me tell you something. That's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. Let's make sure that we are backing up what we say by the way that we live. It's when we profess with our lips, but we don't practice with our life. Are you living in hypocrisy? Are you like that worthless clay pot that is being covered up with silver dross? Listen, I know. I went to a Christian college. I went to a Christian school. It is easy to just kind of fit in, say the right things, and know full well that you're not doing what you're saying. That's not real. Let me tell you something. You can live that way if you want, but you'll never impact anybody for Christ. As a matter of fact, you will turn people away. One of the greatest things that I hear and you hear when you're witnessing to somebody is, I don't go to that church because of all the hypocrites. And you know what? The truth is, there's a lot of hypocrites out there, but by God's grace, you and I don't have to be one. We can be real and genuine and sincere before God. So it's when we hear God's Word, but we don't heed. Is that a part of your life? I'm trying to help you. Be, be sincere. Be real. It's when we profess with our lips, but we don't practice with our life. And then finally, I want you to turn to Isaiah 58. Isaiah chapter 58. We're just looking at three characteristics. There's really several more that we could look at through the New Testament and Old Testament. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, there's a whole group of people that Jesus called hypocrites. Who are they? The Pharisees, all right? And all these characteristics you can see in their life. And I believe in some sense of the word, we have raised a generation at times of pharisaical Christians, and we know how to put on the right things. We know how to say the right words. But the real issue is our heart. And that's what we're going to get to right here in this third point. Number one, when we hear God, but we don't heed. Number two, when we profess with our lips, but we don't practice with our life. And then finally, number three, and this is a big one, and I want to finish out with this one. Number three, it's when we focus on outward action, 
But we forget inward attitude. We're living in hypocrisy when we focus on outward action, but we forget inward attitude. You'll see that as we read Isaiah 58, starting in verse 1. It says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. They seek me daily, they delight to know my ways. Sure looks like on the outside everything's fine. As a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God, they ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. If we were to stop right now, it looks like they're worshiping God, they're having their devotions, they're doing the right things. But obviously there's a serious problem here. Look what he says in verse 3. He says, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find, uh, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. He says you're doing all the right things, but you're doing it with the wrong heart, with the wrong motivations. Verse 5 says this, Is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day unto the Lord? Obviously, the answer is no. That's not what God is looking for. God is not looking for us to just go through a bunch of motions and religion and rituals. God wants our heart. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways, Solomon said. And so he finishes out by showing us what kind of fast he's looking for. Verse 6, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to be holy, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, to have a forgiving spirit, and that ye break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out of the house, to have a heart of compassion for people? Here's what he's saying. You're doing all the right things, but you don't love anybody, you don't forgive anybody, and you're not holy. So is that really what God wants? Is for us to just do the right things? I'll tell you what, folks. It's not about doing right. It's about being right. Now, before I go on, I want to hasten to say I am not saying that we ought to throw out externals. That we just don't talk about external standards. But I do believe in our fundamentalist circles and in Baptist churches these days and in our generation, we have so overemphasized externals that we have a bunch of kids who know how to do the right things, but they don't have a right heart. And there's two extremes. There's one extreme that says, all right, let's just get our kids to wear the right clothes, don't listen to rap music. I mean, that's really bad. And don't cuss and don't go out and, and do anything wicked with your boyfriend or girlfriend. And as long as you don't do those things, you're holy. Let me tell you something, folks. That is not a proper view of holiness. Holiness is primarily an internal quality that manifests itself on the outside. That is an extreme position. If you've been taught that, that is wrong. It is not right to say that just because you dress right, act right, talk right, and do right on the outside that you must be right. But there's also the other extreme. And I believe in a sense we have young people who are reacting to that false view of holiness and they're reacting. And so what they're doing is they're throwing out all the externals. And they're saying, well, brother, it's all about the heart. Well, that's true. But if you have a heart for God, what will you want to dress like? And if you have a heart for God, what kind of music ought you want to listen to? You see, if you have a heart for God, it will affect every area of your life. And what I'm saying is we've got to get a proper balance and start with the heart and move it out into our life. That's exactly what First Peter chapter 1 says when, when Peter says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end, for the graces will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. For as He which hath called you is holy, be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And so Peter understood that it starts with our thinking and then it comes out in our living. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. So I want to say and declare to you that I am a firm believer in having right dress standards. I am a firm believer in having right music standards. But I believe they ought to be based upon a heart for God. And your heart is the most important thing. And I'll tell you, the biggest problem is the reason why we have a lot of young people who are just throwing out standards is because we have a lot of young people who don't really have their hearts in tune with the truth of, of Jesus Christ. Because if you read the Bible, the same way I read the Bible, it says we ought to judge all things. We ought to be discerning Christians. But it, don't overemphasize and just get to the point where you, you say, well, as long as I obey the rules here at Clearwater, I must be right with God. No, your heart must be right. When we focus on outward action and we forget inward attitude, we are living in hypocrisy. Jesus told the Pharisees, you better start cleaning the inside of the cup. Better start washing the inside of the cup. Can I ask you a question? Is your heart right with God tonight, this morning? 
Is your heart right with God today? Oh, I know you're looking good. I know it looks like you're doing right on the outside, but that's not the issue. It's not about doing right. It's about being right. God wants your heart. You know what? This is one of the scariest things about raising my children. I am proud to tell you that I'm raising them in a sheltered environment. Amen. Why wouldn't I shelter them? You think I'm going to let my girls go to the devil? I'll tell you what, I'd rather die than lose my kids. I am going to shelter my kids, but I'll tell you what, I don't want to raise my girls to think, well, Daddy just wants me to be good. No, I want them to be godly. And there's a big difference. You can be good. You can do a lot of right things on the outside and not be godly. And I am trying to shepherd my children's heart. I'm trying to guide them in the right direction. Show them why we do what we do. Show them why all these things are important. And I believe in your life, and as a college student, you ought to get to the point where you understand that God wants your heart. He doesn't just want your dress code. He doesn't want just your music. He wants you. He wants your heart. And let's just be flat out honest. The reason why we don't dress right and act right sometimes is because we haven't given God our heart. And we want our way, not God's way. So let's make sure we focus on the right thing. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot shirt covered with silver dross. When we hear God's Word, but we don't heed. When we profess with our lips, but we don't practice it with our life. And when we focus on outward action, but we forget inward attitude. It was the 1980 Boston Marathon. Her name was Rosie Reese. She won the women's race. There was one serious problem. She did not run the whole race. As a matter of fact, she ran one mile. She jumped into the race at the 25-mile mark, and she had been sitting there probably uh, drinking coffee, eating a donut, while everybody else was running the race. She had illegally obtained her number from the New York Marathon. She was a fake. She was a phony. She had the number. She had the running shoes. Everybody thought she was the winner. But after a week of viewing the video and the photos, they figured out that Rosie was not in the race. My friend, I believe we have a lot of Christians who are not in the race. They're trying to put on the right things. They're trying to jump in at the last minute. And they're going to they're sadly be disappointed when they reach the finish line. Let's not be hip- hypocrites. Let's be real and genuine and make an impact for the cause of Christ, now and for the rest of our lives. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? You know, even in this time of brief invitation, it'd be really easy, be really easy for us to play the game again and and not be honest with God. All I'm asking you to do is be honest. How many of you say today, Brother Mark, God pointed out to me, God pointed out to me at least a hint of hypocrisy in my life. God pointed out to me something of hypocrisy in my life. If that's you, just lift your hand. God pointed it out to me. Thank you. I'm seeing hands across the building. Thank you. Just lift it up. Be honest with God. God already knows what you're like. Thank you. I'm seeing hands being lifted. Anybody else want to just lift your hand? I hope sometime today you will get alone with God and and you will talk to God specifically and, and ask Him for a life change. And that you will be focused on becoming a sincere, genuine Christian. Right now, just for just a few seconds, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to just talk to God from your seat to God and be honest with God about what He's dealing with you about right now. Father, how I praise You for these young people. Thank You so much for bringing them to Clearwater Christian College. Thank You for the opportunities that You are giving them. But, oh Lord, I pray that this will be a healthy caution to all of us, including this preacher, that we will realize that just because we go through the motions, just because we claim to be religious, doesn't mean we're right with God. Lord, I pray You'll root out any hypocrisy. I pray that You'll make us into genuine, sincere Honest Christians, what you see is what you get so that we can impact our world for Jesus Christ. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. I pray for every young person that lifted their hand. Lord, help them to get alone with you today and to be honest. They need help. Help them to find somebody to talk to and get these things taken care of. And Lord, I pray you'll use us now and in the future. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.